Hello and welcome to this 40k vlog. Um, tomorrow, 7th edition will have been out for a week. So it's kind of frustrating for me that I'm bringing you this video almost a week into 7th edition. But today my 7th edition uh, rulebook actually arrived. So I wasn't actually able to bring you this video before then. But it arrived today. So I'm going to do this video now. Um, having said that, I am aware that because 7th edition has been out for a week, loads of you will have probably played a few games, you've probably uh, read the rulebook a couple of times, you're probably more deep into 7th edition than I am, so you'll probably be hearing the, the opinions of someone who's maybe not as well versed in 7th edition as you. I therefore completely understand if you're like, hey, it's a week in, I'm not interested in this video. Um, but for what it's worth, here is my review of 7th edition. So... How I'm going to be doing this video is basically going through the book and I'm going to talk about all the changes. If I don't mention something, assume it stayed the same. There's also a few minor changes that I'm just sort of not going to mention. Uh, one off the top of my head is like uh, little niggly things. Like, I don't know, um, if you take a uh, dozer blade, it gives you plus one to your ramming or something. So little, little minor things like that, I'm just barely going to... I might gloss over. I'm going to talk about the major things. And if I don't talk about it at all, assume it stayed the same. However, if you think I missed something major, do comment below and say, hey, Warwick, you've got to talk about this. Because then that's cool, because I learn from that. So, you know, uh, feel free about that. I'm also going to do this video in one long take. I'm just going to sit down with the book and talk about all the changes start to beginning. So, I'm not aware how long this will go on for. You guys will be aware because you'll see down in the, you know, uh, the bar how many minutes are on this video. But if it's a really long time, pause the video now. Uh, maybe get up some painting you need to do. Maybe go downstairs, get yourself a popcorn, get a drink, get really comfy and just settle in because I'm going to take my time with this and just go over the book and talk about what's new, what's different. Um, and then the last thing I want to add is, I won't talk about like kind of niggly things, like I say, that little thing about dozer blades, which is one off the top of my head. I am aware of stuff like that, but I might not mention it. The other thing I won't mention is things like super heavies, uh, super heavy walkers, uh, gargantuan monstrous creatures, stuff like that. And the reason is because all of that stuff is in the Apocalypse book, and it's not changed, it's just been folded into the regular rule book. So if I don't talk about that stuff, you know why. Um, so we're just about ready to start. Like I say, if you're not interested in this because you feel you're already pretty deep into 7th for my thoughts on it are useless, I understand. But for what it's worth, here are my thoughts on the 7th edition rulebook. So first impressions, I'm, I'm pretty happy guys. Um, uh, uh, some of the changes have sort of nerfed things that I like. Uh, flying monstrous creatures we'll talk about later. Stuff like that. But... I never really mind changes that nerf things uh, that I like, as long as it makes sense. And I think a lot of the f changes to this rulebook, they make sense. You're like, well, yeah, well, logically that should... You know, it's just... makes sense, and I'm fine with that. The second thing I like about this book is just more streamlined and clear than the previous edition. And although there's not massive changes, the whole game just seems to have more fluidity. So I'm pretty, pretty, uh, pretty happy with the book. You know, I spent this whole week waiting for it, and I was like, when, when it arrived in the mail, I was like a little kid uh, on uh, Christmas Day. I was like, if anyone's seen the Nintendo 64 uh, kid in a, it's like a viral YouTube video. I was that kid when I opened it up, and as I read through, I, yeah, I'm really happy with the book. So those are my first impressions. So without further ado, let's get in and start going through it. So, from the core principles, uh, you know, the, the basics of the game, you know, rounding up uh, for, you know, halving characteristics and, you know, what a D6 is and all that stuff, everything pretty much stayed the same. The only thing I noticed they did add was um, there's now a D66, and essentially what that is, I'm not, not actually come up across uh, any situations where you would use that, so I'm not, I'm not sure about that. But basically what happens is you roll two dice, uh, the first dice is the number in tens and the second dice is the number in units. So you roll a three, that's 30, and then you roll a five, that's 35. You know, pretty simple. So that's just one little thing I noticed for what it's worth. Um, second of all, we move, start moving into sort of uh, how the turn is structured. And as I said in the intro to this video, 
I really, really like the fact they start laying out everything in like really nice summaries. Um, with rule sets as uh, complex as some of like wargaming like this, and I know there's more complex wargames, but let's be honest, for like the, the standard, you know, Joe public, this is pretty dense uh, 40k. Um, not as bad as fantasy, but you know, for like a, for a regular casual sort of gamer, it's pretty dense, and I really think. The way they've streamlined it and laid out, you know, start one, at the start of your turn, resolve, you, had it, you know, step two, and the, the, the way they're laying out everything, I really like. It's making things clearer, and it's also going to save time uh, when you're, you know, flicking through. So, moving on, the next change I came up with, like I say, I'm not going to say, oh yeah, this stayed the same, I'm just going to ignore it if things stayed the same, is there's a slight tweak in unit, unit coherency, and that's now if you're in a ruin, you can be six inches apart, because obviously there's the issue that... Um, the gaps between certain levels on the ruins are six inches, so it means that you can have you know guys on one floor and guys on another floor being six inches apart. Makes sense. Good change. Behind it, you know, good good stuff. So the rest of the stuff pretty much stayed the same. And then we get to our first huge change after movement, uh, and that is the psychic phase. Wow, where to start with this? So. Let's just dive in, shall we? Basically, there is now a new psychic phase. So you have your movement, and then you go into the psychic phase. And this is actually the first time since seventh, um, second edition that there's been a psychic phase in the game. Uh, if anyone listening to this was around in second edition, please comment below and let me know. <laughs> I'd be really impressed if, uh, you know, maximum respect to anyone who's been uh, in the game that long, uh, much longer than me. But um, yeah, so we now have a psychic phase, and effectively this is how it works. Now I'm not going to be reading this from the book, this is just going to be a quick summary. So forgive me if I don't mention everything here. At the start of the psychic phase, the person whose turn it is rolls a d6. And that generates warp charge. They're, both players then add um, the mastery levels of all of the psychers in their armies. Um, and they get totals. So I roll a dice, I get a four. I have one Psyker in my army who's mastery level one. Um, that gives me five warp charge. You don't have any Psykers, that gives you four. And then what happens is you then declare a target and the person who turn it is uses his warp charges to try and generate a psychic power. Uh, Having taken that test, okay, well, no, actually, no, let's, let's go back a bit. This is how you take that psychic test. For each, um, you know, uh, where it will say, like, how many warp charges you need. So, um, for example, prescience is now, you need two warp charge. And that is the number of four ups you need. And you can choose how many uh, dice from your warp pool you put in. So, let's suppose uh, I'm doing prescience, I need two. Uh, and I have a warp charge of five, like I said. I can choose to put in two dice and roll two dice. And if I get two four ups, it goes off. If I don't get two four ups, it doesn't. I could have put in all five and you know tried to get two four ups out of that five. However, this is where perils of the warp comes in, because if you put more dice in, you're more likely for your uh, psychic power to be successful, because you'll get more likely to get those four ups. However, if you get one or more, sorry two or more sixes, you know, double six or triple six or anything like that, you perils. And the perils of the warp table is freaking brutal. Um, well, to varying degrees. The first three are all pretty, pretty nasty. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because it'll take forever. It's, all, it's already going to be a really long video and, you know, you guys can look it up in your book quite easily. So, um, but then if you get to some of the later ones, it's just more of a case of you take a wound or you can pass a test and not take a wound. Uh, and then you can even get a warp surge, which gives you like a free up invon save and cool stuff. So if you get any double six out of that, you perils. So let's say I put in two dice and I did manage to get two four ups. Just, you know, luck of the draw. That power has then been successful. However, you um, then get a chance to deny the witch. And you can even deny the witch against blessings, which you couldn't in uh, the previous edition. Uh, there's also, however, if you try and deny the witch against blessings, you don't get the modifiers that you would do. For example, there's modifiers if there's a psychic in the squad denying the witch, 
uh, if that Psyker has a higher mastery level, if you have stuff like uh, Adamantium Will, it all, it all affects uh, the, the role you need to nullify his warp charge. Um, but, like I say, if you're trying to do that against a, ble uh, a Blessing, you don't have any of those you know, added modifiers. So how do you um, deny the Witch? Well, you put in dice from, you know, you choose how many dice from your warp charge pool, which you got generated when the guy whose turn it was did, and you try and nullify them by rolling sixes. And for each six you roll, you can nullify one of his warp charge points. So uh, I just said I rolled the two four ups, um, and you roll two six ups, that nullifies it because it takes away them there. So there's sort of like kind of this sort of bluff and counter bluff of how much you're going to put in and you know do I put in more there and then try and deny that or you know it, it's cool it's cool um, and then if you can't deny it the psychic power goes off as normal there's also been a slight tweak um, in terms of uh, how you generate psychic powers uh, well not not really but uh, basically if you choose all of your psychic powers from the same discipline your mastery level uh, now means the number of power well number of powers you can get uh, a mastery level one psychic can still try and do a, uh, a power that needs warp charge two, uh, but it just means the number of uh, powers you can select. So, if you if you generate them all from the same discipline, uh, you get the Primaris power for free, which is cool. So, for example, my Hive Tyrant he has to draw his powers from the Tyranid um, the Tyranid psychic powers. So, and he's a mastery level of two, so I roll two dice, uh, one after the other on that table, generate two powers, and I get Dominion for free. So he gets an extra power. It's pretty cool. Uh, he can only, because he's a mastery level two, he can only do one per turn. But yeah, that's that's pretty nice. Um, so, <laughs> I think I've given a pretty, a pretty, uh, a pretty nice summary of uh, how all that works. Um, there's still the same sort of maledictions, blessings, and now there's conjuring where you can summon demons and stuff. Uh, psychic hoods mean you can start trying to deny the witch even though you're not the closest unit and things like that. Um, there's now, you can't cast uh, blessings onto units in transports. And if you're a tra psychic in a transport, the only thing you can do out of your transport is fire witch fire. Little things like that. Um, I won't go too into all the nuances, but I think I've done a a pretty roundabout summary of the basics of the psyching phase. So, this is a review, I will describe what the new changes are and then I'll say what I think of it. I like this, um, I don't have a minority there, I think this is kind of cool, uh, you know, the fact that it has its own dedicated phase and the fact there's all this kind of, I'm trying to dispel that and I'm trying to, you know, get that and it's kind of like, oh, do I want to put that into that? The, f the perils table is a lot of fun, I mean, even if you perils and, you know, uh, completely annihilate your squad. It's just kind of, I think that's kind of cool. Um, and also, I'm not going to talk about, well, I might talk about it a bit later, but the new psychic tables, there are some really nice powers on there. Like, uh, really cool. So, for example, Iron Arm, just now plus three strength and toughness. Nice. If only Tyranids had access to it. Oh, well. So, yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll move on from psychic powers. But like I say, overall, I'm pretty behind this. I'm quite excited to try these out. Um, I probably mentioned this at the beginning, but let, uh, probably later this week, expect it sort of Sunday, Monday time. I will be doing a 7th edition battle report, and I'm really looking forward to trying out, you know, this new psychic stuff. I will have some psychers in that army, and it's going to be cool. So, let's move on. Uh, shooting phase. The big change here, in a nutshell, is before all of the shooting attacks in a unit was sort of resolved at the same time so often what you would do is you would take suppose you had a tactical squad the go to example and you had bolt guns in there and you had um, a plasma in there and you had a missile launcher in there what you do is suppose you had eight bolt gun shots you'd put eight black dice in one green dice for the plasma gun uh, and one bright pink diced for the missile launcher and you could just roll it all together uh, stuff like that it was a bit of a mess and now what you do is you resolve things by the uh, the weapon which to be fair sometimes you would do anyway just because it sort of makes sense you know just I'll oh, roll that first roll that first um, and so what would happen now is in that example you would choose uh, okay the plasma gun is going to shoot first you'd roll that uh, okay, now the bolt guns are going to shoot, you'd roll that and resolve and see what happens there. And now the missile launcher is going to shoot and you'd roll that. 
Um, kind of like this change, you know, it seems to make sense to me. Um, the only thing is though, it does mean you're going to have to think more tactically about the order you do stuff. Suppose you've got flamers, you want to cover those templates the most things you can. So you definitely want to be firing flamers first, then firing your bolt guns. You know, stuff like that, you're going to have to think about things a little bit more than you would have. But hey, we're getting used to it, and you know, it's cool. So, uh, yeah. The other thing I've noticed, I haven't... Um, I've spent this week watching a lot of 7th edition reviews. Because like I say, I was itching to get the book, and you know, that made... Uh, you know, I just read through this in about an hour or two, and then I'm now doing this video. Um, one thing I noticed when I was reading through that I haven't really seen any reviews is I cannot find focus fire anywhere in the shooting edition, uh, shooting section. So I think focus fire is now gone, which to be fair, not many people use focus fire anyway, so I'm fine with that. Um, correct me if I'm wrong though. Like I say, if I miss anything or you really feel I should have talked about something, please comment below and let me know what you think I should have talked about. But I can't see focus fire, so comment below and let me know if you can. Um, that might be me being inept and not finding it. But it looks to me focus fire has gone. Uh, the next thing, uh, bombs kind of got their own profile. Not too much to say here. Essentially, they're trying to bring uh, bombs into it. You know, they're getting bombers and bombing runs and stuff. So now they got their own uh, section, which is cool. Um, that's about it for shooting. Like I said, there's very limited changes in this edition. There's a few minor ones which could have big effects, and there's stuff like the psychic phase, which is a huge overhaul. So moving out of shooting, getting into terrain. Uh, charging through terrain is now a minus two modifier instead of 3d6 remove the highest. Now this on the face of it is a very subtle change, doesn't seem like much, but I think it can have some big consequences. Um, if you roll 2d6 uh, you know, on a regular charge, the average I believe is seven. I'm not a big number crunching kind of guy, but I believe your average charge distance is seven inches. Uh, 3d6 remove the highest, I believe averages out as four inches. So now you have that minus two, that means uh, that charging through terrain should have increased from an average of four to an average of five. So charging through terrain got better. You know, if you roll a double six, you're gonna charge 10 inches, nice. Um, so yeah, that's that's good news, I think, because uh, it was I found it very annoying. I was doing a Tyranid battle, not a battle report, but I was playing with my Tyranids, and my Hive Tyrant tried to charge like two or three times through terrain and each time he was like getting a total of like three inches every time and it was just frustrating as hell so yeah, yeah good change, I'm up for that. The other big change in the um, sort of combat-y section of uh, the rules is to challenges and thank god for this change, it's such a good change. Um, in a way it's bad for me personally but in another way I'm all behind it and yeah if if it makes the rules fairer I'm totally for it even if it handicaps me in certain situations and that is to challenges uh, because now if you're in a challenge and you absolutely hack a dude down and you you know inflict 10 wounds on a one wound guardsman sergeant the other nine wounds spill over into the rest of the squad yeah good change good change um, now for me that's kind of annoying because when I'm playing Miles with his Dark Angels and his company master charges on his own into a big blob of guardsmen, it means I now can't do the whole sacrificial, my sergeant challenges you, my sergeant challenges you and just tarp him. However, as a Blood Angels player, I've had the other end of the stick. You know, I've had Lamartis charge into a squad of cultists and then the leader of the cultist charges him and he kills him four times over and does nothing. So it stops that annoying, you know, um, stuff happening. Or, you know, uh, my high of tyrant st st uh, charges a tactical squad. Oh, the, tact the tactical uh, marine, <laughs> tactical squad sergeant challenges me. Um, he dies straight away, absolutely eviscerated before he even has a chance to strike. That's the end of it. You know, it stops that stuff. So yeah, that's a really good change. I really like that a lot. Um, yeah, and that's, that's about it for Assault, really. Like I say, if I miss anything out and you feel I should have talked about it, let me know. So, moving on, let's get into changes to unit type. And the big one in this, a few other little ones I won't bother to talk about, but the big one is to flying monstrous creatures. And in a way, they got nerfed. And in another way, they kind of got better. So I'm not really sure what to make of this. So, essentially, the, 
the, the way they got better was grounding checks. Uh, before, if you took a hit, you had to take a grounding check. Which was very annoying, because a LAS pistol, uh, you know, uh, suppose, suppose when uh, Tyranids had iron arm, suppose you put uh, iron arm on your flyrant, he was toughness 9. A LAS pistol shot at him, which couldn't hurt him, but it hit him, he'd still have to take a grounding chest. The other one was marker lights. Hit him with a marker light, he's taken a hit, he must take a grounded test. It was annoying as hell. However, now, you only have to take a grounded check if you have taken one unsaved wound. Which for me, like I, I've been saying this the whole of 6th edition, that that should be the rule, and they've done it, which is awesome. Uh, combined with that, you not only have to just take uh, a grounding test if you've been wounded, but you also only take one per that shooting phase. You take it if you've been wounded in that shooting phase. You take one at the end, um, which is a lot better. So because of that, your monster creatures are less likely to get grounded, and if they do so, it's not it's going to stop the shenanigans with his ground. You know, a marker light grounds him, and now everything can fire him a normal ballistic skill. So that is. Nice, that's, that's really good. However, they've given with one hand and they've taken away with the other hand because the other sort of major change is you now cannot assault in the same turn you change flight mode. So before you could zoom across 24 on one turn, uh, in your second turn, change into glide, move 12, assault. It was really nice. Now if you uh, zoom across 24, and then you change into glide mode, and you move 12, and you're ready to assault, you cannot assault anymore. You have to sit there and take a turn of shooting with everything firing you at a regular ballistic skill, which really does sting the sort of assault-orientated monstrous creature. Um, I don't know how this is going to affect my Flyron. Um, I might have to keep him in glide mode more often and just use him gliding and sort of take, take the shots because he's in more flexibility to assault. Or I might just give up on the assault and have him whiz round firing at stuff with his uh, twiddling devourers. So, I don't know really. It, that, we'll have to see how that pans out. But it's like, in some ways, monsters, fly monsters got better, in other ways they got worse. Um, and that's about it for unit types. There are a few other changes I won't talk about. So now we get into another sort of huge, huge change. And this is to vehicles. So, in 5th edition, vehicles were just god. They were really like far too overpowered, and I I didn't like it because uh, I'm an infantry guy. You know, people who like vehicles obviously loved it. Not so, not for me, not for me. In sixth edition, though, the pendulum did swing too far the other way, and vehicles were too weak. This looks like it's brought vehicles back in line with what they should be, which is strong, but perhaps not too strong. Um, and that mainly has manifested itself in the new vehicle damage table. So, I'll talk through this uh, in full. 1 to 3 is now shaken. Yeah, you heard me right. 1 to 3 is now shaken. 4 is stunned. 5 is weapon destroyed. 6 is immobilised. And 7 plus is explodes. This means if you want to make a vehicle explode, you have to be an AP1 or an AP2 weapon. Or the vehicle has to be open topped. Um, another change there is also the fact that once a vehicle explodes, uh, the explosion on the outside has gone up from uh, strength 3 AP dash to strength 4 AP dash. So that could be really nasty if your Lehman Russ explodes in a big blob of guardsmen and takes strength 4 hits on everything. Or, you know, you assault something with orcs. That could be really nasty, you know, this big strength 4 blast. Especially if you're a 6 on it. It could be really unkind. You know, my guardsmen struggled with strength 3 blasts, you know, let alone strength 4. Um... Um, the other change is, um, as well as the, the strength 4 one, uh, the other one I was talking about was if a vehicle explodes, you now don't place a crater down. It just gets removed. Uh, there's, no me me there's no reference here to the area where the vehicle was becomes difficult terrain or anything like that. Um, so that's, that's very different. So what do I think of this? Uh, you now can't blow up a, a, a tank with, with a missile launcher. I'm not sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to sit on the fence on this one, because on the one hand, vehicles 
And like I say, I'm an infantry guy, so it kind of hurts me to say this. Vehicles did need a buff. They were a bit too weak. So in a way, yeah, all good that they're now stronger. But at the same time, it doesn't make a whole load of sense to me. Um, Michael at Tactical Imperialis, when he was talking about rumours, was pretty adamant about this point, and that's... It's a missile launcher. What's its job? Destroy tanks, and yet it can't blow up a tank. It just doesn't seem to make much sense. But then at the same time, I can see why they've done it. So, I, I, I don't know. It, we'll have to wait and see. But overall, I'm cautiously quite positive about it, even if it is a bit, a bit dumb that, you know, missile launchers can't blow up a tank, you know. Um... Yeah, we we'll have to wait and see. The other sort of big change there is we um, vehicles are no now always weapon skill one unless they're immobilized, which I a hundred percent support because it was really really annoying that um, there was loads of time just like I'm gonna move an inch, I'm gonna move an inch, I'm gonna move an inch just in case you got assaulted, and it really was just pointless and annoying. It's like my Lehman Russes uh, can still fire everything if they move an inch because they're heavy tanks. Uh, so it was just, I was just moving an inch just for the, you know, for the assaulting thing. Now they don't even have to do that because they're always weapon skill one, which is, yeah, I, I think that's a good change. Um, yeah, good stuff there. So let's move on to flyers and flyers in a way got, got a buff and in another way did not and here's what I mean by that the weakness to sort of nerf the flyers was the fact that lock velocity and stuff is now gone and what you have is on a 7 they explode like a regular vehicle but on a 6 if they get immobilized they crash and burn anyway which makes it more likely for flyers to be blown up out of the sky however the buff they got uh, I'll talk more about Jink later but instead of evade they can now evade and they gain the jink rule which is a four plus cover save instead of a five up cover save um i'm going to talk more about jink later so i'm going to do as that but so in a way that's sort of a buff because i guess they're getting a better uh, cover save and um the snap firing thing again i'll talk about this more later but they were snap firing anyway on evade so yeah it's, it's, it's you know in a way i think that's a buff um so let's move on to chariots I won't go into detail here, and the reason I won't is because how many chariots do you see in the game other than command barges? You know, so Necron players, I'm sorry, but I won't go into too much detail here just because it's so rare to see chariots. But essentially, chariots got a buff. If, you, um, if you're if you on a chariot, uh, you now sort of count as one... You know, it's what you fight from and you can't disembark from a chariot. It's not a transport anymore. But this gives them buff in several ways. So, for example, um, if the I think the controlling player can choose who takes the hit. So you can go, okay, I'm going to take the you know this melter blast on the chariot, or I can take it on the overlord on the chariot. Um, also, if that chariot gets destroyed and you have something like you know a reanimation protocol, royal court resorb that kind of stuff. I'm not a Necron player, as you can probably tell. Uh, you can then roll to reanimate your lord or overlord or whatever, and your chariot will come back with one hull point. So I think chariots got a bit of a buff there. But like I say, I, chariots hardly ever come up in sort of the games I play. So personally, I wasn't uh, too interested in that. I was just like, okay, that's cool. Uh, so now let's talk about Jink, um, which is what I probably should have done a second ago. We're talking about now. Um, so the changes to Jink is essentially this. Um, you now don't automatically get it. You choose whether to Jink. Um, so, and you do this before any dice are rolled, which in a way is a nerf. Well, no, it is a nerf, because um, I can go, I'm going to fire my missile launcher at you. Are you going to Jink? You say, yes, I'm going to Jink. And then my missile launcher misses, and it's not like you needed to. Where if I, whereas if it, it, I'd already hit, then it's obviously, you know, going to jink seems like the better option so you have to kind of gamble whether you think it's a good idea to jink or not the positive side of that is jink is now on a four up instead of a five up which is better and downside to that though as well as having to choose before anything's fired you just choose when it's declared you also now jink um 
you have to fire snapshots the next round. So bikes, I fire at a squad of space marine bikes. Do you want a jink? Yes, I do. You get a four-up cover save. However, next stop, your snap, uh, next uh, turn, your snap firing. So jink got better and worse. Um, I can't really, you know, it's that classic thing they've given with one hand and made it a four-up, but they've taken away, you know. Um, however, if that nerfs wave serpents in any way, you know, with their, you know, skimming skimmers and jinx, I'm happy because wave serpents are too good. <laughs> I think like. I should probably do a video of this in itself, but I really, really rate Wave Serpents very highly. I think Wave Serpents might be the best vehicle in the game in 6th edition. They were so good. Uh, so if anyway, if that forces them to fire snapshots or something, I'm all for that. Um, so yeah, that, that's about it for Jink. Um, other sort of, you know, uh, vehicle types. Uh, Walkers gained Hammer of Wrath, which is yes, yes. Like, I don't, I don't see why Walkers didn't have Hammer of Wrath before. You know, uh, monstrous creatures did, jump infantry did, you know, think about it, a dreadnought smashing into you might hurt a bit. So, uh, yeah, I, I supported that one. Um, and then we start getting into more of the mission types, and then we get um, the new warlord traits. Now, I'm not going to read out all the warlord traits, because there's loads of tables, and there's loads of sort of, uh, you know, things to look up. However, what I would say is we have got a completely new Warlord table. There's now four. And the new Warlord table is to do with sort of the tactical objective and Maelstrom, Maelstrom of War missions, which I will talk about later. You know, I'm going through this book, you know, A to B. I'm just, you know, so I'll talk about that in a second. But the tactical traits are all stuff to do with discarding tactical objectives or giving you an extra tactical objective and stuff like that. So it's obviously only useful if you're playing those missions. Uh, but yeah, more on that later. It's no, there's no point in me talking about that until I've talked about the tactical objective-based missions. Then as for command plates, personal traits, and strategic traits, like I say, I'm not going to go in and read all of them because there's, you know, uh, a whole load of them. I mean, 18 traits there I could talk about, which take me ages. But um, overall, I'd say, is it just me, or have these got better? You know, I was reading through, and there's a lot more like, hey, that sounds good. I mean, it's particularly target priority for a shooty army. In the shooting phase, your warlord and all friendly units within 12 uh, re-roll rolls to hit. Think about that for a second. Imagine that in a Tau gun line. Imagine that in my uh, Imperial Guard gun line. Um, or... The assaulty version of that on a six. Um, imagine that in a big, you know, assaulty unit, re-rolling all your ones. You know, the stuff of like that just seems really good. And then, um, yeah, like <laughs> overall, I think they've really improved the warlord traits, which is great. Um, especially when you consider with, um, I'll talk about bound and unbound armies in a second. But um, especially when you consider you can re-roll that on your. Um, your, uh, your, if you take a bound on you can re-roll that. So, you know, the chances of you getting something that's actually useful, because so many times in 6th edition, like, it seemed to be more often than not, you'd roll it and be like, well, that's useless. Um, you know, it, sh it should be good. So, yeah, i 100% behind that. Next up, we have the new Allies Matrix, and this has changed in a number of ways. Um, I talked earlier about how I've been watching, you know, loads and loads of uh, reviews of 7th edition. No one has really mentioned this, and I find that very disturbing. You can now ally with yourself. Is that just me, or was that not in 6th edition? No? No one has mentioned this. All the reviews I've seen, everyone's like, oh yeah, you know, this has changed and this has changed. But no one's mentioning the fact you can now ally with yourself. So you can now be Tyranids, and take an allied detachment of Tyranids, and have 3 HQs and 7 troop choices, and it be still bound. That's big. That's a big change. I can't understand when. Is it people haven't noticed, or I, I don't know. Like that's to me, that seems like a very different change. So I'm all behind that. Um, they've also changed. Um, come the apocalypse, you can now ally with people. However, it's you're counted as enemies. So for stuff like you know um, certain psychic powers that just target enemies, it will still target people in your own army. You can't deploy within twelve of each other. If you move too close to each other, you have to do that one eye open thing. So even though you can now do like Tyranids and Space Marine allies, uh, which doesn't make any sense, even though you can now do that, it, there's a lot of penalties to, you know, that kind of stuff. They've also removed the amount of Battle Brothers, um, like armies of the Imperium Battle Brothers, um, 
uh, Dark Elder and Elder are Battle Brothers, and you know, Demons and Chaos are Battle Brothers, but mainly they've sort of reduced the amount of allied combinations or given you more sort of penalties for allying with people. So, yeah, that, that seems good to me. Um, the one thing I would say is though that that come the apocalypse thing, I don't think you should. You know, I know there's a lot of penalties, but it just from a narrative perspective, Tyranids allying with uh, Space Marines, really? Like I just don't. Whatever. Okay, fine. <laughs> it's it's fine. It's fine. So moving on with this kind of uh, you know preparing for battle, the something the section is called. Now any unit can score. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, that's cool, that's really different, um, especially, like, the main problem I was having with my Tyranids is, it was really difficult to cap objectives with Tyranids, because all the sort of troops were assaulty orientated, or not really the sort of thing you want to leave sat on objectives, now anything can cap an objective, awesome, so, you know, I, I'm behind that, um, I, you know, people may, di you know, differ on their views, but that, that seems cool to me. Um, we have Bound and Unbound, and I've talked about this before in other videos, so I'm not going to go into too, too much detail, but basically if you take um, a Bound Army, you get bonuses, you can reroll your uh, Warlord trait, uh, your troops, although everything is scoring, your troops now cannot be contested, which on the face of it doesn't sound like too big a deal, but if I've got my Tactical Squad sitting on objective and you whiz up like a, you know, uh, some elite troops in a skimmer and they jump out, uh, they can't contest it because I'm bound and I'm troops, you know, so uh, your unbound skimmer, you know, it can't contest, which is cool, That that's actually more significant than you would think. So troops still have their place, they're still important for capping objectives if you take a bound army, but everything can still claim objectives. So that's new. I'm not, like I say, I, I won't go into too much detail about how bound and unbound thing, because I've talked about it. It's been talked about to death. It's one of the biggest changes in this edition. And as I've said before, I'm not too worried about it. Um, I think, you know, me and my friends would just play bound, because we prefer that. Um, I think for tournaments, they will clarify it and say you have to do bound. And I think for stuff like narrative campaigns, it's you know, or stuff like that, or if you wanted to do a really themed army, it's maybe cool to do Unbound. Uh, the problem with it, I'm going into too much detail here, I said I wouldn't, but whatever. The problem with it is, you know, oh yeah, I'm going to take nine Riptides, but if you do that, I don't think many people will want to play you, and it's just, I don't think it's going to be very fun for anyone, so I'm not too worried about that. Uh, like I say, tournaments, I think, will just clarify. So, that's Bound and Unbound. Next change, Night Fighting. Night Fighting has changed, and the change to Night Fighting is it used to be anything uh, within 12 to 24 was shrouded. No, sorry, stealth. Anything within 24 to 36 was shrouded. And anything from 36 and over, you couldn't see. Um, which is different from how it was in 5th. In 5th, you had to like roll dice and work out if you could see things. And it was really, really quite annoying. Now, everything on the table has stealth. Which, for me... Personally, I think that is awesome, and the reason I think that is awesome is my Venom probes give things shrouded. Uh, on turn one, there could be stealth and shrouded for pretty much everything in my army, which means my Hormagaunts out in the open are going to have a four up cover save. My uh, Warriors, Venom probes, things in the back of intervening models are going to have a two up cover save. So personally, and this is just, you know, for my army, that could be really, really good. So I'm totally behind anything that's going to gonna make my uh, Tyranids better. So, you know, that's always the way. If things you like get buffed, you're really happy about it. If things you like get nerfed, you're really sad about it. But, you know, I, I, I try and be as neutral as possible. Uh, now let's get into talking about tactical objectives. And I was a bit wary of this and not really you know, kind of, I was just a bit, eh, I don't, I don't know, I'll have to wait and see. Now I've actually got this and read through it, I am unhealthily excited about this. I think this is so cool. Uh, first of all, the fact we still have the Eternal War missions, brilliant. Then you have Maelstrom of War missions as well. The fact you can choose between them, that's so cool. That gives you, like, a whole new different way to play. And diversity is interesting, and I'm all behind it. And then, when you actually look at what the tactical objectives do... The tactical objectives, um, it's like, hold that objective uh, that turn, 
and then you score a victory point, which is cool because in the previous edition, or well, you know, in the Eternal Wash missions, is you just have to cap the objective at the end of the game. So you could ignore objectives until turn five, six, seven, then just get yourself in place, the game ends, you've won the game. It was a bit. I don't know, I think you should be rewarded for holding on to that objective for, you know, those turns. And that does that. And also, the fact your tactical objectives are changing and stuff, and you can discard tactical objectives, it makes the game more dynamic. It makes, uh, you know, I just... Wow! <laughs> I just, you know, as I was reading through, I'm just all up for it, and I really can't wait to start playing some of these Maelstrom of War missions. I am totally behind this. And even if they get old and stale, you can return to the Eternal War missions. So the flexibility of allowing you to do both is awesome. Okay, so moving on from the whole sort of preparing for battle and you know uh, all of that kind of stuff, now we get to um, special rules and there's been a couple of changes in special rules. Um, stuff like you know split fire, you now don't have to take a morale check for and then poison has changed a little bit, got a little bit worse. There's a few things but I won't go into detail. The main one I found was smash um, which has changed from halving your number of attacks to giving you one attack. It's pretty, pretty unfortunate for Tyranids for cracking open the vehicles. Um, but you know, I was speaking to Miles about it, and he said, "Well, it sort of makes sense because it's like you know, you're putting everything into one big hit." Yeah. Okay. I I I, I can roll with that. It's um. Yeah, so I won't talk. I won't go into too much detail. There's been a few other changes to special rules, but nothing, nothing too major. Um, next up, we have new terrain, and you've got stuff like the Manufactorum and like all the Citadel uh, sort of terrain that you can get off from GW, and a lot of them have special rules, which obviously you know encourages you to uh, go out and buy a Citadel terrain, which we actually, me and Miles actually do have, uh, you know, some Citadel terrain, so that that's cool, and it gives you like little things, like in the Manufactorum, for example. You reroll armor saves from gets hot rolls and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's all fun. I won't go into detail, but yeah, that's that's cool. And then at the very end of the book, we have the new psychic powers. Now this video is already 42 minutes long. I don't think anyone really wants me to just you know talk about them for ages. But essentially, you've got two new tables, and we got some really cool stuff on there. Like, um, we got the vortex of doom. I mean, that's just a great name. I, <laughs> Vortex of Doom gives you a strength D, blast, AP 1. You know, you've got from Demonology where you can summon, uh, you know, demons. And you've got uh, malefic powers. Uh, even stuff like, you know, Biomancy got better. There's there's all sorts of changes here. But overall, Psychic Powers, they have got better, the, the Codex ones. So, yeah, that's about it. This video, like I predicted, was a long one. So I hope you guys enjoyed doing your painting, uh, doing, you know, eating your popcorn, whatever you've been doing for the last 40 minutes while listening to me. Um, you know, uh, thank you if you listened all the way through. I hope you uh, found this useful. I hope you might have found it entertaining. I hope you enjoyed hearing my thoughts. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, uh, make sure you like it and support my channel. I can't tell you how grateful I'd be if uh, you do that. It really does support my channel. And if you've disliked this video, that's totally fine. But please, 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 could you comment below and let me know why you left a dislike so I can try and improve the channel. Um, you know, I can't improve if you don't tell me what the problem is. Uh, recently, a few of my videos got random dislikes. I didn't understand why. Like, starting from scratch, episode 11 got a dislike. I was like, why? Like, who just randomly tuned in? To, if someone's following the series, I'd, you know, just let me know why you've left a dislike so I can try and improve as a YouTuber. Um, yeah, and also if you're new to my videos, be sure to hit subscribe, plenty more to come, and I will probably see you very soon with a 7th edition battle report, can't wait for that. So I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day, and I'll see you soon in another video. Bye for now.